Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of, where are we? Amos. He is a famous prophet. That's right, growing away. I encourage you to take notes as we're going through again, just looking at Jesus in every book of the Bible. Um, each week, one book going right through the Bible just helps us to really get the main view of the Bible, which is Jesus and his salvation. Today in Amos, one of the great, great things that I just really resonated with me last week as we uh, were coming to another one of the prophets, and I wondered, you know, what are we getting fresh with each of the prophets? There are 17 books of prophets written by 16 prophets. There are more prophets than that in the Old Testament, but 16 wrote books. One of them wrote two books. Who was that? Jeremiah, that's right. And I was just impressed last week that they are so much like the four Gospels in the sense that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all about Jesus, but we know that they are four different views of the life and ministry of Jesus. And we learn different aspects and different details from each of the gospel writers. And it's like the 17 books of the prophets. They're all preachers. They're all God's messengers calling the people to repent and come back to the Lord, just like just like the evangelists of the New Testament. But they are each giving us a different view of what is going on in Israel, whether it's Israel in the north or Judah in the south. There's some aspect of the decay of the two nations that they're addressing, and there is also some aspect of the character and the nature of God that's being addressed. And each one giving us a a little bit different information about Jesus. And as we know, Jesus is present, pictured, prophesied in all the books of the Bible. He is there. So today, Jesus in Amos, the theme that I have given for Amos is the word oppression. Because that describes what Amos is addressing in the the national life of the northern kingdom of Israel, oppression. Amos indicts Israel for their oppression of the poor, their mistreatment of the poor. My key verse, Amos 5.24, he says, but let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. So he's calling the people to carry out just treatment of people and especially not, not abuse the poor in the legal system. Jesus, Matthew 15, 32 said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. Of course, many places in the Gospels where we know that Jesus is out to help the poor. He is moved with compassion on for the poor, where the disciples are often saying, you know, send them away. They followed with you a long time. Send them away so that they can go find food. And Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. He had compassion on the poor. In our outline, first of all, I want to just tell you the story of Amos. Who is Amos? What's going on in his life? His name means burden or burden bearer, and that's what he does, the Lord puts on him a burden to go and speak to Israel of the north. He's not a religious leader. He's not a priest. He is not anybody who is seen as a spiritual or religious leader in the life of Israel. And in fact, he is a shepherd and a farmer. He tends sycamore trees. He raises cattle and sheep. In the southern kingdom of Judah, about 11 miles outside of Jerusalem, lives in a city called Tekoa. He ministers during the reign of King Uzziah, which is the same as Isaiah. You remember in Isaiah 6, he said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. So it was about that time 
that Amos would be a contemporary of Isaiah. Secondly, the message. The message of Amos. Whenever we picture Israel in this time of the prophets addressing the moral decay, you know, I don't know about you, but I get this picture of a a decay in other ways. Decay of the economy and and the moral decay gives me a sense of this just, you know, crime rampant and all these things. And in fact, that's not really the case. When Amos goes and preaches to the northern kingdom of Israel, it is a time of national prosperity. In fact, Israel has become a trade route. They're abounding in not just their common needs, but even luxury items. You know, when a country begins to, to prosper, then we, uh, the, we make enough for ourselves, then we're able to trade for it, and we start to, to multiply in profits, and an economy grows. And that's what's happening in Israel of the north. It's a time of peace with their neighbors. They're not being threatened by neighbors. They're in peace. They they're even have an outward show of religious excitement. But that really is an outward hypocrisy because inwardly there is, as all the prophets are addressing, uh, this turning toward idols. And that's why the prophets are being sent. Amos addresses four problems in the life of Israel at this time. Number one is mainly the oppression of the poor. The oppression of the poor. Amos 4.1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. That's kind. Who are on the mountains of Samaria. Notice that, the mountains of Samaria. You remember how the Jews in the New Testament hated to go through the area of Samaria? The Samaritans lived there. Uh, Do you know who the Samaritans were? They were the, the descendants of the, of the intermarrying of the Jews in the Assyrians whenever the Jews were taken captive by the Assyrians. So it was, a, it was a racial divide there. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy. Also in Amos 3.9, he says something similar. Amos 2.6 Here is a phrase that you see repeated early in Amos. For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They were concerned with fashion, whatever it took. They were willing to take advantage of the poor for their fashion needs. A second problem Amos addresses is is this indulgent lifestyle, a luxurious indulgence in material things. Amos 3.15, I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. Amos 6.4 through 6, Who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments. Now, is there anything wrong with having nice things? Yes or no? No, there's nothing wrong with it. But that became the priority of their life. Just laying around, enjoying the extra things that God had provided to the neglect of the spiritual focus of the nation. And even, even in their, their, uh, their nice things and their heightened form of living, they're just walking over the poor and not sharing things. A third problem was the problem of false worship, which is all through the prophets. 
Amos goes to Bethel. Now, he lives near Jerusalem in the south. He goes north to a place called Bethel, which is part of Samaria, and he speaks out there his messages against their idolatry. He goes to Bethel for a specific reason, and he calls the people to come back into agreement with God's word. You remember another of the prophets addressed that Israel would be like God's wife, who is uh, Hosea. Israel is like God's wife who has played the harlot, who is separated from God because of her harlotries. Amos 3.3 is my first verse I use in marriage counseling. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? No. You get the picture of two people walking together in a direction, and the picture is God and his people or God in you, can you walk together in the course of life unless you are agreed on where you're going? The answer is no, No, it's it's a rhetorical question. And I'll sit with young couples ready to get married and I'll say, look, they wanna know what am I gonna talk to them about in marriage counseling? And I'll say, look, we're gonna talk about a lot of issues. Your spiritual life, finances, that'll be fun. Um, You just down the list of things that need to be addressed. But here's the main thing. Can two walk together unless they agree? Let's find out if the two of you even agree on the kind of life you want together before you get married and figure out uh, that you don't really like this person. You have different direction, different goals, and different thinking in life. Amos 5.2 says the virgin of Israel has fallen. The virgin of Israel has fallen. There has to be two coming together in agreement. And Amos is like calling the people of Israel as God's wife to come back. Come back to that place of agreement so we can now live together and continue on together. There was a big story of marriage this week. Did you hear it? I know you've been waiting and waiting for this. Brad and Angelina finally got, did you know this, Kim? Is this what you were nodding about? Brad and Angelina finally got married. After all these years of saying that that that's old-fashioned and that doesn't apply to them, they keep having kids and adopting kids and this big family and they love family, but they didn't want to get married. Do you know why they got married? Their kids said it's time. Even children know If you're going to be together, you better make a commitment. At Bethel, several significant things happened in the life of Israel. At Bethel, Abraham pitched his tent after he made the covenant with God in Genesis 12. At Bethel, Jacob worshipped God after seeing a ladder extending up to heaven and angels ascending and descending upon it. And he named the place Bethel, which means house of God. Because that's the place where he met with God. Israel went back there after losing in a battle and they realized we are out of God's will. And they went back to Bethel to repent and to get their lives back on track. It was at Bethel, as history goes on, that Israel set up a false place of idol worship to the Egyptian calf idols. The very place that God had used to bring people into an intimate relationship with him, the people of Israel set up an altar to worship calves. A place of idolatry. But it's that same place You remember in John 4 that Jesus says, I must go through where? Samaria. I must go through Samaria. And he goes by a well in the middle of the day and the disciples go off into town to get food. And what is Jesus waiting by the well for? The Samaritan woman. And when she comes out there, he asks her for water. 
And she says, why is it that you being a Jew are asking of me water to drink? Jesus says, if you drink of this water again, you will thirst again. You will thirst. But if you drink of the water that I will give, it will be it will spring up into everlasting life. And she, and she gets a little, bit, a little bit testy with him and says, well, our father Jacob gave us this well. She remembers the history. She knows the significance of the place, but she doesn't know God. And Jesus, being the God of the Old Testament, the same one who met Jacob and revealed himself to that same Jacob, when Jacob said he had seen the Lord, it was Jesus, right? And now Jesus reveals himself to this woman who thinks she already knows God, but she doesn't. And the Lord might send you out of your way to someone who thinks they know God, but they don't. And Jesus goes to the same place and draws her into a relationship with the Lord. Jesus said in John 4, 23 and 24, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amazing. The fourth thing that Amos addresses is a general blindness in the national life of Israel. Blindness to God's blessings, but blindness to the ways that God has already been bringing smaller judgments into their life. The judgments of famine, drought, locusts that we looked at last week, they're they're not catching on that God is trying to shake them and get their attention to wake up. But in Amos 2, God says, well, I was the one who brought so many blessings. I was the one who destroyed the Amorite before you. I was the one who delivered you from Egypt. And I raised some of your sons to be prophets. God is saying, I'm the one who did it. How often do good things happen and we think to ourselves, well, I'm the one who did that. It's pretty common among us Christians to think that that we're the ones who accomplish something. And if something bad happens, we talk ourselves out of it like, oh, that was nothing. God loves me. We don't quite see or discern what's really happening. Next in our outline is to look at Jesus in Amos. Because Jesus is present and working in the life and ministry of Amos. Turn over to Amos 9.1. As I read Amos 9.1, the first, just the first line, notice how familiar this sounds. I saw the Lord standing by the altar. This is so similar to Isaiah 6.1 when he says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, in the New Testament, John 12, 41 confirms to us that Isaiah saw Jesus. Isaiah, or John tells us that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. That's a connection that a lot of us don't make. When Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, we're just kind of, well, did he see God? Yes, he says he saw God, but... Jesus clarified that no man has seen the Father at any time. We don't see the Holy Spirit because he is a spirit. So when people see God in the Old Testament, it must be the Son of God. Just not called by the name of Jesus. So I would say that when, I, when Amos says, I saw the Lord standing by the altar... It is the same as what Isaiah saw. He sees the Lord before 
his birth in the Gospels. He says in Isaiah, in, I, I'm confusing him, in Amos now, that he's ready to judge. He's ready to bring the judgment, probably of the Assyrians coming to take them off captives. But also the book finishes with an amazing promise of the Lord that one day he will restore the nation. And I want to finish with this part. Amos 9, 8, yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. Then skip down to verse 15. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle or the house or tent of David, which has fallen down, speaking of his family and his family line, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in the land, and no longer, no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord. Amazingly, with all of these prophets, as we get through the bad news, we get through all the negative stuff of the sin, the ugliness, the idolatry of Israel or Judah, that God gets to the heart of what he's trying to convey. Please come back to me. Please come back to me as a wife who is left saying, come back to me. As, as you have, you've walked away into your own path, Amos says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? So the Lord's saying, eventually one day there's going to be a remnant who will return to me. I will return them, restore them, replant them, and they will be my people never, ever to be taken away again. Amos is one of these obscure books that you think, well, does anybody pay attention to Amos? Actually, in the New Testament, this section is quoted. In Jerusalem, at the, whenever the church is up and running and there is a, the elders of the church in Jerusalem, and it becomes clear that God is pouring out his spirit upon Gentiles now even, not just Jews, and these Jewish leaders of the church are debating, well, what do we do with these Gentile believers? Do we impose on them uh, any of the Jewish regulations or obligations that we as Jews follow? There was a debate about circumcision. Do we make these Gentiles follow this thing? And, and they're saying, you know, they said, look, God has already given them the Holy Spirit. And if God's given him a spirit, that means he has already accepted them. So who are we to come along and add these re religious regulations upon them as if, there's, as if they're not good enough to be accepted by the Lord already? That's amazing to see people the way God sees them. If God's already accepted them, then don't add any burdens to them. It was Paul who argued that. And then James quotes Amos 9, 11, and 12, the section I just read from, for you from Amos 9. But he adds something to it that we don't see in Amos 9. He adds, after this, I will return and will, will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and all the rest of it. So the Lord himself says, I will return, and then I will do these things. So amazingly, we see right there in this little book of Amos that many of you have maybe never read, Amos sees the Lord, and the Lord says to him, I'm going to return, 
and I am going to rebuild the old waste places. What's surprising to me as we go through the prophets is how many of the Old Testament prophets speak of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The second coming of Jesus Christ. Because that's exactly what's going to happen when Jesus returns. He is going to rebuild and establish his people. His glory will be seen from that place, Israel, from Jerusalem. Just as we close the book, there's just some great lessons here I hope you want to remember and write down. Looking through the eyes of the prophets, we just see things about the character and the nature of God that are so profound. This book that addresses social injustice, this is a timely book because our community, our country is so highly focused on social injustice in our time. Here is a book where I just want you to see the cause of the oppression of the poor. What is it? It is when a country turns away from God. It is a problem, but it's a symptom of a greater problem. The real problem of Israel is that they have turned away from God. And I point that out because we are being called as Christians to make the main focus of our attention the relieving of the, the oppression of the poor, social injustice. We should be about that. We should be about helping the poor. Amen. Feeding the poor, helping to clothe the poor. But it is a symptom of a greater problem, which is idolatry. A nation that has turned away from God has excelled in luxury to the oppression of the poor. Social injustice is the result of turning from God. Number two, I want you to write down that the cure of social injustice is the gospel. It's not just food and clothes. It's not equal rights, although laws should be passed to protect the poor. But the cure is come back to God. Third, maybe for America, like Israel, God will warn of coming justice in small judgments. God will warn a country with small judgments. Famines, locusts, drought... Oh, those will pass. And God's saying, no, I did it. I did it, and I did it to wake you up. Oh, the economy, it'll rebound. It always rebounds. It always rebounds because our country has a pattern of turning back to God in crisis. Well, it was just a coincidence that the economy rebounded. I don't think so. Have you ever had a need and you called your friends and said, you know, I want you to pray for me. Then a few days later, the need's taken care of and you call them back and say, oh, it's okay, I don't need you to pray. It's all, it's all worked out. It worked out because you got everybody praying for you. The last thing and the main thing to reinforce is that God is always looking for restoration and revival. Amazingly, Amos, Amos and the issues Amos is addressing is exactly the state of the United States of America right now. Luxury, turning from God, taking advantage of the poor. Politicians talk about the disappearing of the middle class. Go to the store and you notice prices increase and it's harder and harder for the lower 
the lower income families to live. And God brings revival, not just social justice, revival. I see so much in Amos where he is saying, saying and speaking of the conditions that we are facing today. But because we're in it, we start to think, oh, it'll pass. We are God's people. And that was the danger of Israel. They just said, oh, we're God's people, we're okay. And God was really saying, well, because you're my people, I hold you to a higher standard. Get your act together. It's time to repent and to come back to me. Let's stand together. Lord, your word is good. Your patience is, is just everlasting, but there is a moment of reckoning, Lord. And maybe each of us has a, a place like Bethel in our own life where we we started an intimate fellowship with you, but we've lost it, we've left it. And you just call us back to that place, back to our first love, to, uh, to renew things, to get back on track. And Lord, we just pray that you would cleanse our hearts, you would renew us and fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we are just restored and renewed in the things that you have planned for our lives. We pray in your name. Amen. There will be people up here to pray for you. If you'd just like to come to the front or stay for a few minutes, they'll be available for you. God bless.